Hey everybody, it's Derek Colmartin from CodeOpinion.com. So you have a service that needs data from another service, but you're trying to avoid a synchronous blocking call to the other service because that introduces temporal coupling, and you're trying to avoid that because of availability concerns. So what's an alternative? Well, one solution is event carry state transfer. Let me explain. I wanna thank Solace for sponsoring this video. Solace provides a complete event streaming and management platform that makes it easier to design, deploy, and manage event-driven architecture across hybrid, multi-cloud, and IoT environments. For more on Solace, check out the link in the description. So let's say we have many different services and they need to communicate and get data from each other. And there can be many different reasons why this happens. So we have a client, it makes a request to service A. Now service A needs to get data from service B, but it could be many different services that it needs to get data from. And this could be for a variety of reasons, one of which could be because it's doing some type of UI composition for a query. The other would, could be that it needs to get data from service B because we're performing some type of action. Now, the problem with being temporarily coupled like this is that we need service B to be online so that it can accept and return a response based off that request. Now, the problem is what happens if that request fails? If service B is unavailable or something wrong with it, it's timing out, it can't give us back the response to get the back the data that we need. So this ultimately will fail all the way back to the client. We want service A to not be temporally coupled to any other services because we want it to be available even though service B is unavailable. This means that we want all our services to be independent. That means that when a client requests data from any service, for example, to service A, that it doesn't need to make a request to any other service to get data. That means that in order to do that, it has to have all the data it needs within its own database, within its own logical boundary, so that it doesn't need to reach out synchronously with a blocking call to any other service. So one way of accomplishing this is to get notified anytime something happens within another service so that you can reach out to it to get the data that you need that you can keep within your own service boundary. So for example, if something happens to service B, there's some type of operation where a product was updated and an order was placed. What it will do is when that happens, it will publish an event to our message broker and service A can subscribe to that event to know, okay, I need this product information and it's been updated. So once that happens, I'm gonna go reach back out to service B and say, okay, give me the updated information. From there, I can just store that in within my own logical boundary within my database. So what we have here is really a local cache of data from other services. And since we have all the data that we need, we're not temporally coupled anymore. We're just using kind of this notification in asynchronous messaging to go get data from other services when we know it's changed. But there's kind of two problems with this method that I just illustrated, is that when service B, something changes and we send that message to the broker and we pick up that message from service A, if there are a lot of changes that are occurring, we're gonna to have to be making a lot of calls back to service B, increasing the load on service B. You're gonna be making a lot of calls to get data back to update your local cache, potentially. The other one is availability again, is that now we're having to make these calls back, these callbacks to the producer, service B. What happens if we can't get that data that we need? Are we okay with stale data whenever we can get it and it becomes available again? So we know that our data is stale, but it's just how long is that gonna stale data be there if we can't go get the newest copy? So the answer to that problem is event carried state transfer, which is the idea that our events are actually just not gonna be notifying that something changed, but they're actually gonna contain the state of an entity or something that we're gonna use to keep our local cache updated, which means that we don't need to now make that callback to the producer to service B. So in service B, when something changes, let's say a product changed, it's gonna include the details of that entity, of that product, and how it exists now, at that moment when it changed. So when service A picks up that state change, that event, it can just then go immediately update its own local cache copy. It doesn't need to reach out to service B. So we have what the state was at that point in time when it occurred from service B and it publishes that event. So as an example, we have a customer changed event that contains all the state about a customer. So it has customer change, has an ID, a name, an address, an email, a phone, et cetera, everything that represents the state of that customer when it actually changed. This is what will be published, and this is what we would be using from that other service to update our local cache copy. So there's three key points that we need to talk about in terms of this data and what it represents. 
So first, it's that it's immutable. And that's because that we're publishing data from a service boundary as like an integration event to other service boundaries so we can keep our local cache copy. Now, the thing is, is that it's immutable because we don't own that data if we're just consuming it for our local cache. It's exactly that. It's another boundary's data. Now, another boundary may have a different representation of that data internally into it. So it may be publishing an integration event, which is how we can think of these event carry state transfer events, is that they're integration events and we're providing this data. The second piece of this is that we have to know that this, or we assume that this data is stale and we have to treat it that way. If we have this as a local cache, you would think of any cache, it's stale data. So you need to be able to understand that the operations that you're performing within your boundary on this data, that's cache data, you have to realize it is stale because we don't know necessarily how quickly that the producer who owns that data is publishing these events. So we have stale data and you need to treat it like that and understand that. And lastly, you need to version these events. And that's because if you change some entity like a customer or a product, and it happens very quickly, depending on how you consume these and in what order, even if you're using first in first out queues, you could be processing them concurrently and you need to know which one is actually the latest. So that means we need to add a version as well to these events. So this could be an integer, this could be that we're incrementing, this could be a date time, something that's always gonna be incrementing so that we can compare this to our database. So if we're using the competing consumers pattern, that means that we have multiple instances of our service that's consuming messages off our queue so we can do more work. We can process more messages concurrently. So if service A has a customer changed event that it publishes for customer one, two, three, and it has that exact same event the state is different, but it's the same customer changed event for customer one, two, three. So now really the second message is the most up-to-date version of our customer record that we're publishing to let service B know. But because service B has two instances, it's gonna consume those messages potentially concurrently if they're both available. Now these messages, if you're using first in, first out, will get delivered in order but that doesn't mean that they're gonna get processed in order. Because they're both available, we could end up processing these messages concurrently. That means that the first message may finish last, which is actually the out of stale, the out of date stale version. So if we were recording that version that we keep in the event now, as well as in our database, we know when we process these messages, we can do our update statement or however we're ever dealing with our database to say, okay, this is the version I have in the event this is the version in the database. Is my version greater? If yes, then update. So that way we know when we're processing these messages concurrently, we're gonna use the most up-to-date version. So what type of data would you wanna keep in a local cache from other service boundaries? Well, to me, when I think about a system, at the core is really kind of the, the complexity. It's a lot of transactional data that you're working with. And that transactional data needs reference data usually. And that reference data comes from boundaries that are more in a supporting role. And they're the ones that manage and own that type of data. So to me, that's usually where this lives. Also as well as because this data that's kind of in these uh, reference data that's in these supporting roles, these other boundaries, they usually don't change that often. So in terms of dealing with staleness, it's really not that much of a concern because it's not changing that much to begin with. So finally, I wanna illustrate one example of where I don't think you should use event carried state transfer. And that's because the example I'm about to show is really talking about transactional data and not reference data. And this is a part of a workflow. So we have a client that's gonna go through a checkout process for our shopping basket. Now, the thing is when most people are thinking of this and using event carried state transfer is because they're including everything about the order, for example. And if that payment uh, information is a part of that pro checkout process, well, that's part of the event. No, rather you should be directing a part of each part of the workflow to the correct service so they have the information that should be owned by the service that needs it. So what that checkout process really looks like is it's not dealing with like one ordering, for example, it's gonna be dealing with ordering and payment. So when our client goes to check out, we, maybe we create some initial order and from there, the client has some type of order ID or it's the one generating it. And when now when the user goes to, to the payment information and fills out the payment information, it's actually sending that to our payment service with that order ID that we're gonna store locally in our payment services database. Now, really, this is just temporary. We're not charging the customer's credit card or anything yet because we haven't completed the order. They haven't reviewed it and confirmed it. 
So really, we're just storing this inf information, possibly temporarily, because they could totally abandon the checkout process. But now, once they've done that, they reviewed their order, they confirm it. At this point, we can update our order status. And from here, what we're going to do is we're going to generate an order placed event. Now, this isn't event carried state transfer. This is more of an event for notification for workflow. It's just going to contain that order ID saying, hey, the order was placed. So at that point, our payment service can pick up that event, which again is just for notification to see, oh, this is order ID one, two, three. Guess what? I have all the payment details in my database. I don't need it from the event. It was directly sent to me because I own that data. And now I can use that data to go to my payment gateway to charge the customer. So hopefully this illustrated how you can use something like event carried state transfer to keep a local cache within your service boundary from data from other service boundaries. And generally those service boundaries are going to be more kind of in a supporting role for reference data. And lastly, really look at my last example there in terms of data ownership. Do you really need to propagate data around or are you just not directing it in the correct place where the data should really be owned? Thanks to all the developer level members on YouTube and Patreon. I really do appreciate your support. If you're interested in joining, check out the links in the description where you can get access to a private Discord server to communicate with other like-minded developers about software architecture and design, as well as any source code that I show in any video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.